All right. In that last lesson, we talked about the basics of our PA catheter, including the, the different parts, lumens of that catheter. Um, in that lesson, I briefly talked about some of the values and waveforms that we would see when we're transducing those ports. And in this lesson, I'm going to dig deeper into each one. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. Now, in that last lesson, along with going over the basics of our PA cath, uh, I did also mention that we have a couple ports that we are going to be running pressure tubing to and transducing pressures. Well, in this lesson here, we're going to talk about that a bit more and then discuss the different waveforms that we'll see at various points along the path of our PA catheter. Now, of the waveforms that we're going to discuss, um, almost all of them are ones that you're going to typically see at any given time uh, once the PA catheter is in place. Um, but there is one exception to this, which I'll mention when we get there. So to start off, I'm actually going to put up a diagram of the heart up here. And as we talk through these different waveforms, we're going to slowly begin tracing the path of our PA catheter. And then we'll talk about the different pressures along the journey here. So to start things off, after entering into a vein, and whether that's an IJ, subclavian, or femoral, our PA catheter, if you remember, is going to be moving along and we're first going to come to our right atrium, and thus we will get our right atrial pressure here. Now, depending on the location of the catheter, uh, as well as the size of the heart, we may actually be reading a CVP, um, but for all intents and purposes, these are going to be the same measure. Now, this one is important to know and understand, especially if you don't work in a cardiac ICU or if you don't work with PA catheters all that often. This is basically the same waveform that we're going to see when we're transducing the distal port of a central line to get our central venous pressure or CVP. All right, so here's an example of a right atrial pressure that we have corresponding with an ECG and an arterial pressure tracing. We'll kind of use this as reference as we go through and talk about the different parts of the waveform here. Now here is actually the CVP waveform enlarged so that we can talk about these different parts. So remember that a waveform is just a graphical representation of measured pressures over time. As the pressure goes up, the waveform goes up, and the pressure goes down, we see the waveform go down. Now this pressure here specifically with our right atrial pressure is going to be the physiological consequence of changes in pressure in either the vena cava or the right atrium in relation to their compliance as well as the volume of blood. And we'll kind of get into talking a little bit more about that here in just a minute. But with this waveform you're going to notice that we have three waves here and two descents which I'm going to go over now. So first, starting off, um, I'm actually going to use blue to mark this part here. This is going to be what we refer to as our A wave. Now this is the atrial contraction pressure as the atria contract and then pump that blood into the ventricles. Again, this is going to be the result of both the volume of blood that's in the atrium and the compliance of that atrium. If we have a compliant atrium, which means it can stretch and absorb the pressure, we're going to see a smaller A wave. And if it's a non-compliant atrium, then we're going to have a larger A wave as a result. Same goes for if there's more volume, we're going to see a larger A wave. And then less volume, we're going to see the smaller A wave. Remember that the pressure that we read consists of both the compliance or the stretchability of whatever compartment or vasculature that we're in, as well as how much volume blood we have in there. Now, for seeing this part of the waveform on our tracing up here, that this is going to just follow the P wave on the ECG, as well as we're going to see it in late diastole on the arterial pressure tracing, which I went ahead and marked both of those on here so you can see that alignment. All right, the next part of the waveform is actually our C wave, which I have marked here in yellow. Now, this one's not always easily seen, especially with patients who are tachycardic. Um, it tends to merge with the A wave at these times, and thus you may only see the two waveforms and the two descents. Now this wave is the result of the movement or bowing of the tricuspid valve back towards the atrium during that ventricular contraction or systole. 
So during this time, there's actually a transient decrease in atrial compliance, uh, as well as an increase in atrial pressure as a result of that movement or bowing of that valve. Now this part of the waveform we're gonna see during or just following the QRS complex, uh, and it is gonna be seen with the systolic upstroke on the arterial pressure tracing. All right, so next in our waveform is gonna be something that we call the X descent, which I'm gonna mark in purple pink here. Now this decrease in the pressure tracing is a result of the uh, atrial relaxation. And here the tricuspid valve also descending back down towards the apex of the heart. So if you remember with that C wave that that tricuspid valve bowed back out towards the atria and so now it's returning back to its normal position creating more quote unquote room in the atrium. Now we're gonna see this carry through the end of our QRS and is seen mid systole on the arterial pressure tracing. All right, again, moving on, next we have our V wave, which I'm going to mark in red here. So this is going to be the result of the passive venous filling of the atrium. So here the relatively empty atrium will now have blood rushing in to fill it, thus the increase in pressure. The height of the V wave is going to depend on, again, the right atrial compliance, as well as the volume of blood that's filling the atrium. Now, a large V-wave could also be tricuspid valve regurgitation. If the blood is rushing back into the atrium during ventricular systole, that this is going to increase the V-wave. That said, though, you can have a somewhat large TV regurgitation without a large V-wave if the right atrium is very compliant and can stretch to absorb the volume. Now, all of this is going to correspond to the T-wave on our ECG, and late systole on the arterial tracing. All right, now finally we have what we call the Y descent, which I'm gonna mark here in green. And this part of the wave is the result of rapid emptying of the right atrium after the tricuspid valve opens and blood rushes back in to fill the right ventricle. This part we're gonna see after the T wave on the ECG and is really the early diastole on our arterial tracing. And this is going to continue downward until we get to the start of our next A-wave upstroke, starting all over the next waveform. All right, so now that we have the right atrial pressure CVP out of the way, moving along with our heart diagram here, um, following the path of the PA catheter, we would then move from the right atrium across the tricuspid valve and into that right ventricle. And this is going to be the next pressure that we encounter. Now. This isn't something that we typically are going to see with our swan in place, but it is seen during insertion of the PA cath as it makes its way along this path, as well as we can see it sometimes during movement with inspiration, uh, if there's malposition or migration of that PA catheter tip, as well as in extreme cases of cardiomegaly where the heart is so large that the right atrial pressure port is actually positioned inside the right ventricle due to the size of the heart being so large. All right, so let me go ahead and put up an example of a right ventricular waveform here corresponding with our ECG. So as you can see, this is a much simpler waveform when we compare it to some of the others. Um, we have a rapid increase in pressure from the ventricular contraction during systole. Then we have a rapid decrease in pressure once that pulmonic valve opens and the blood is rushing out into the pulmonary artery. Um, this is also a very dynamic waveform, so it's got a very high and very low pressure. And on this pressure waveform, our ventricular diastole is actually going to be the small increase that we see here at the bottom just before the RV contraction. And that's going to be as that tricuspid valve opens and the blood is rushing in from the atrium to the ventricle. Now, sometimes we may also see an A wave right before this rapid increase in the pressure from systole, and this would be a result of that atrial contraction. That said, this isn't something that we're always able to notice. Now, when we are measuring this pressure, remember that for our systolic pressure, we want to use the wave that follows the highest wave. And then for our diastolic pressure, we want to use the reading that precedes the systolic wave that we just used so the lowest point right before that wave. All right, so moving right along with our heart diagram, our PA catheter is now going through the pulmonic valve and into the pulmonary artery, and thus we're gonna see our patient's pulmonary artery pressure. So you're gonna see this as an obviously increased diastolic pressure 
in the pulmonary artery versus the right ventricle. So here's an example of that with the waveform here corresponding with the ECG moving from an RV waveform into a pulmonary artery waveform. So this increase in the diastolic pressure is something that we refer to as the diastolic step up. And so here our pulmonary artery systolic pressure is basically equal to our right ventricular systolic pressure. Now some differences though is that after this peak systolic pressure, we're gonna see the beginning of a descent with a small peak on that descent of the wave. As you probably guessed, this is the dichrotic notch, and this corresponds to the closure of the pulmonic valve. So think of this just like the arterial pressure tracing dichrotic notch that you know and love so well, um, but this is gonna be the pulmonic valve instead of the aortic valve. Now, the steepness, or how slow or fast the diastolic runoff is for going down towards our pulmonary artery diastolic, is going to be a consequence of the compliance of the pulmonary artery, something that we refer to as our pulmonary vascular resistance, or PVR. The higher the PVR, the less the compliance. So the pulmonary artery systolic peak occurs during the T wave, and it comes after RV systolic peak. Hopefully this makes sense, but this is due to the pulmonary artery pressure waveform not beginning until the right ventricular pressure has exceeded the diastolic pressure to the pulmonary artery, causing that pulmonic valve to open and then for blood to flow into the pulmonary artery. And again, for measuring, remember that we want to use the wave that follows the highest wave for our systolic pressure. And then for our diastolic, we want to use the lowest point that precedes the wave that we just used for our systolic pressure. All right, now finally wrapping up our travel of the PA catheter on our diagram here, we have the catheter that moves into either the right or left pulmonary artery, and then eventually becomes wedged in one of the smaller branches, giving us our pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, also known as the pulmonary artery occlusive pressure. So this measurement is actually gonna be an approximation of the left atrial pressure. Since we have the balloon inflated, we're stopping any of the forward pressure from the pulmonary artery reaching the tip of the catheter. And thus, we only register the back pressure of blood coming from further up the system, which I've kind of illustrated here. So here, the pressure from the left atrium is transmitted back through the pulmonary veins, passing through the pulmonary capillaries, and then is eventually read with our pulmonary artery catheter tip. Now this waveform actually resembles our right atrial pressure. That said, the C wave is gonna be absent here. And this is because that pressure is transmitted through the pulmonary capillary bed before it's picked up by our pulmonary artery catheter, that this actually dampens the pressure wave by the time we actually read it. So we're just gonna have an A wave and a V wave and an X descent and a Y descent. And so here, the, the A wave on this waveform is actually gonna be delayed in relation to the P wave on ECG when we compare it to the right atrial pressure. Now this is due to the pressure having to make its way back through the pulmonary veins, pulmonary capillary bed, through the pulmonary artery, as well as the long part of the pulmonary artery catheter before we can actually read it. So even though functionally they're happening at the same time, we're gonna see on our monitor, our waveform, that the pulmonary artery occlusive pressure or the wedge pressure is actually gonna be coming after our right atrial pressure. So usually it's gonna be appearing near the end of the QRS complex in a normal patient. Now when we are measuring this pressure, we wanna look for the A wave, and then the peak of the A wave is gonna to correspond to the left atrial pressure. Whew, all right, so that really completes the journey of our PA catheter from insertion to its final position. Um, we talked about those four different waveforms that we're gonna see along the way, as well as their makeup, um, but remember that typically we're not gonna see the RV waveform and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or the pulmonary artery occlusive pressure, whatever you wanna call it, is only obtained when the balloon is inflated. The right atrial pressure, CVP, and the pulmonary artery pressures are really the only ones that we're gonna have a continuous reading on.
So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that. As well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.